A quarter of a century ago, I went to Vienna for the first time. Of all the cities in the world, Vienna calls music most to mind. Many of the great composers of the 18th and 19th centuries lived and worked in its graceful environs. The central cemetery contains, with a million and a half other graves, those of Gluck, Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms, Mahler, and the two Johann Strausses. And although Mozart was from Salzburg and had his best successes in Prague and traveled as far as Naples and Paris and London in his young days as a child prodigy, it was in Vienna that he lived and worked and suffered most. And it was there he died. It was in Vienna that he was laid in a common grave. It's a curious story. Not a single mourner stood by when the young composer's remains were disposed of, not in the great central Friedhof, but in a little suburban cemetery. On that first trip to Vienna, I found Rauensteingasse 8, the address where Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart died, almost in the shadow of St. Stephen's Cathedral. A Mozart court stood on the site, half demolished, with stone images of Gluck and Carabini, Beethoven and Haydn staring into space, as if overawed by the Mozart who, when he lived here, wrote such strange and difficult music. Behind the facade of Rauensteingasse 8, there was nothing to interest me. The house where Mozart lived through his last months was no more. A few blocks away, Vienna had preserved another house, the place where, in a happier day, Mozart had composed that most vivacious, profound, and revolutionary opera, The Marriage of Figaro. Perhaps it was better to preserve the memory of that triumph, and not the memory of the death here in the Rauensteingasse. As Mozart lay on his deathbed, another opera of his, some will say the greatest ever written, was running nightly in a people's theater beyond the old walls. That was the magic flute. Everyone loved it. Little children, young lovers, shopkeepers, professors from the university. The 200 ducats Mozart was paid to write it wasn't enough even to cover his debts, while the joy and beauty he gave to all who came to see it were altogether immeasurable. Night after night, Lying in the house in the Rauensteingasse in a fever, he would follow in his imagination the performance of the magic flute across the city. He would look at his watch and say, Ah, now they are all laughing at the bird catcher's song. Now they are hearing how man and wife together can reach to godliness. Now the prince and princess are passing unharmed through the fire and water. Then, if his strength held out, he would work some more on a requiem mass. He was never to finish it. This is Father Owen Lee. I am a Catholic priest, and I have stood at the bedsides of more than a few dying people. I have seen them fevered, confused, dying before they could provide for their families, dying too young to have realized their potential. But I know of no death like Mozart's, not one with so many unanswered questions. He wasn't afraid of death. His Freemasonry had taught him to think of death as a friend. But toward the end, he suffered under a peculiar illusion. His last work, A Mass for the Dead, had been commissioned by an anonymous messenger who one day appeared unannounced before him, dressed in gray. Mozart was to write a requiem, quickly, and he was to tell no one, nor ever try to find out whence the commission came. He started writing, observing the secrecy imposed on him. And when he turned to another assignment, when he hurried off to Prague, planning en route to complete an opera the court there had commissioned, the gray stranger reappeared to warn him that the time for the requiem was running out. His health began to fail, so fast that he was sure he was poisoned, and his letters, too, grew feverish. I cannot rid myself of the sight of that strange man. I see him constantly entreating me, impatiently demanding the work, and I know from what I suffer that my hour is come. I am at the point of death. 
Actually, the sinister-looking stranger was only a servant sent by a rich Viennese nobleman who was in the habit of commissioning works from professional composers and passing them off as his own. But to the fevered Mozart, the stranger was an emissary from another world. The death he was writing a requiem for was, he began to believe, his own. He was in fact working on the requiem the day he died. He lay in bed and some of the singers from the magic flute came to see him and, at his request, sang the pages he had just written. Lacrimosa dies illa, that day of tears. After a few measures, Mozart wept so fitfully that they had to stop. Later he sank into a delirium, during which he kept trying to complete the requiem. As always, he had it fully composed in his head, but there wasn't time to get it down on paper. Shortly after midnight, he died. As I stood there twenty-five years ago at Rauensteingasse 8, shut out by that irrelevant stone facade, I wanted somehow to make amends. They had sent for a priest that night. Mozart's wife, Constanza, ill herself, asked her sister to go to the Peterskirche and plead for one to come. I know pretty well the reply she got. This Mozart has turned Freemason, and besides, it is well known he has displeased his grace, the Archbishop in Salzburg. Yes, that worldly and unworthy ecclesiastic in his clift castle in Salzburg once paid Mozart less than the valets and cooks he made him eat with, treated him always with contempt, and finally had him thrown bodily from his presence. I walked to that symbol of Vienna, St. Stephen's Cathedral. Here, a wealthy Freemason had arranged for Mozart's funeral, but for the least expensive funeral available. There was no mass. A solitary priest blessed Mozart's corpse before only a few mourners. Constanza had been taken away by friends. Then the accounts say the funeral party was proceeding to the little cemetery of St. Mark's when a sudden storm sent them all scurrying to their homes. One lone grave digger saw the body into the earth. A sudden blustery storm, so we are told. It makes a romantic story. Actually, records indicate that December 6, 1791, was a mild, misty, windless day in Vienna. Why then did the mourners all leave? Why was the coffin abandoned? Why, when Constanza finally visited the cemetery and asked to see the grave, could no one tell her where it was? In my ministry, and earlier when I had helped my grandfather digging graves in a little German town in Michigan, I had laid to rest some unfortunate men, poor, disinherited, imprisoned, crazed, but none had gone so unattended as had this man, perhaps the greatest natural genius known to humankind. I made the two-mile walk from St. Stephen's to the cemetery of St. Mark's, a tiny place now half-hidden in a subsection of Vienna. Old people were sitting there in the sunlight. I didn't know if I would find any grave supposed to be Mozart's, but I hoped at least to find the pauper's section. Mozart, I asked. Mozart, an old woman responded. Da, hinter den Bäumen. And there, behind the trees, was a broken column, a desolate stone angel, and the name in small letters. It was touchingly modest and nicely tended, but the real grave, no one now can say where it is. What did it all mean? This man's genius was, for some, sufficient of itself to demonstrate the existence of God. Yet God left him with us to witness that truth for so short a time and silenced him before we could hear all there was to know. It seemed at once a demonstration and a refutation of providence. I left the cemetery full of emotion but without understanding. I won't say we will find the answers to these questions talking here about Mozart, but these melancholy considerations are all part of any Mozart lover's response to the magic flute. 
even though the magic flute, or Die Zauberflöte, as Mozart called it, is mostly a happy work, at times a radiantly beautiful work, a fairy tale. A fairy tale that, we should say even before we tell the tale, raises still more questions about life and death. The first music in the magic flute, the famous overture, is in the key of E-flat, a key marked on the staff by three flats. And the overture begins with three elegant, shivering E-flat chords. <laughs> of three are, of course, important in myths and fairy tales. In Christian symbolism, three often signifies the Trinity. I am not a Mason, but I have it on good authority that three is also a number with Masonic significance. The magic flute will give us as well three ladies, three boys, three temples, and much more music in three flats. The first audiences at the magic flute, expecting a fairy tale opera, may well have been puzzled by the austerity of the three initial chords, and even more by the religious nature of the adagio that follows them. but the overture then settles into more accessible music, a beautifully developed fugue on a happy theme in the key of three flats. Our orchestra here is the Philharmonia, led by Otto Klemperer. Just when the audiences settle down at last for the expected light entertainment, the happy fugue stops for more of the solemn chords, three times three, in the key upwardly related to E-flat, B-flat. solemn pronouncements will recur in the opera when the hero begins his three trials. This is to be an opera half comic, half serious. It is also, at least partly, a Masonic opera, so some of its meanings are bound to remain obscure to us who are non-initiates. But most people who write about the magic flute today, and the Masonic friends I have spoken to on the subject, will say that the Masonic element in the opera can be, and usually has been, overemphasized. The magic flute, the opera Mozart wrote before he died, is about many things. We first see a rocky landscape overgrown with exotic flowers. A Japanese prince, or as some read the early sources, a Javanese prince, rushes on with a dragon in pursuit. Our endangered prince is Nikolai Geda. In a moment, the prince has fallen exhausted into a faint. Three veiled ladies appear, slay the dragon with their silver spears, exclaim how handsome the unconscious prince is, and go off to call their queen. And what ladies they are, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Crystal Ludwig, and Marga Höfgen. Thank you. 
The prince revives and sees with relief that the dragon is dead. Then a strange little fellow, half man, half bird, appears. He carries a bird cage on his back with bright colored birds inside. In the marionette production of this opera, a favorite children's attraction in Salzburg, he is preceded on stage by a flight of feathered creatures that circle around his head as he begins to sing. He is Papageno, in this recording, Walter Berry, piping on pan pipes and singing a little song that, once heard, is never, ever forgotten. Papageno proclaims that what he most wants in life is a wife to share his kisses. Meanwhile, he catches birds for his queen, the star flaming queen as he calls her, and he receives bread and wine from her in return. Papageno starts with fright when he sees the prince and asks where he came from and is astonished to learn that there are countries other than the one he knows this land of the star-flaming queen, enclosed by its familiar mountains. The prince asks Papageno if he has killed the dragon. Papageno, terrified even more at seeing the beast, nonetheless claims, when he is satisfied that it is dead, that it was indeed he who killed it, and with his bare hands. The three ladies return, give Papageno a stone and water for his bread and wine, and place a padlock on his mouth to punish him for lying. For the truthful prince, they have another gift, a miniature portrait of the queen's daughter, Pamina. The prince, to a lovely tune in three flats, falls in love with Pamina at first sight. How could he not? His own name is Tamino. Then, as thunder sounds, the mountainous background parts to disclose the queen herself, the queen of the night, riding a crescent moon. She first tells the prince, in music of poignant mysteriousness, that her beautiful daughter has been carried off by an evil sorcerer named Sarastro. Then, in a burst of Italianate coloratura, she proclaims that, if the prince can rescue the princess, the beautiful girl will be his. Here is Lucia Pop as the Queen of the Night.
Italians have always called the queen Astra Fiamante, the star flaming one, and she is part of a long line of ambivalent matriarchs in the history of literature and the history of religions. She's been compared to Isis and Ishtar and Astarte and Sibylle and Demeter and Juno, grieving and sympathetic at first, then turning savage, vindictive and destructive. As for the evil Sarastro who opposes the queen, the closeness of his name to that of Zoroaster is intended. Sarastro is some sort of ancestor of Nietzsche's Zarathustra almost a century before Zarathustra. He heralds the destruction of one era and the dawn of a new one. Does that make him good or evil? Neither completely. I think we will see that he is as ambivalent as the queen he confronts. The queen's three ladies now present the prince with a magic flute and, removing the padlock from the birdman's lips, provide him with a set of magic bells. Tamino and Papageno must go together to Sarastro's castle to rescue the queen's daughter. They will be guided there by three boys, whose counsel they must follow. Papageno is not altogether happy about this, especially when he hears that the formidable Sarastro eats Papageno's for breakfast. The scene ends with the three magical ladies bidding the two oddly matched young heroes a kind of Christmas carol Auf Wiedersehen. Years ago, when I was organist at Midnight Mass, I would play this really charming quintet among the carols, and no one ever complained. Everyone thought it was Christmas music. There's an extraordinary mixture of musical styles in the magic flute. The scene changes, and we are in a splendid Egyptian-esque room in the castle fortress of Sarastro. The captive princess has tried to escape, and is being threatened now by one of Sarastro's minions, the Moor Monostatos. Suddenly a rescuer appears. Not the prince, as we might have expected. Our two adventurers have got separated. It's Papageno, the birdman, that comes to the rescue somewhat ineptly. He's never seen a moor before, so he's terrified when he comes face to face with Monostatos. And Monostatos has never seen a birdman before, so he's terrified too. Each, in fact, takes the other for the devil and runs off to hide. Papageno recovers from his fright, however, and steals back to tell the princess that a prince has fallen in love with her and is coming to save her. It's her dream come true. And tender-hearted as she is, 
she tells the birdman that she hopes he too will soon find someone to love. Every creature they sing together in the key of three flats feels love. Love is the secret of the universe. It is what keeps us alive. A player in Mozart's orchestra has told us that on opening night, response to the opera was at first unenthusiastic. I suspect that people were confused at the serious elements injected into the fairy tale they'd come to see. Mozart, who was conducting from the keyboard, was disheartened. But at this duet, we are told, the enthusiasm began to spread. Anyone hearing the duet outside the opera and touched by its angelic charm and innocence will be amazed to discover that its two singers are not in love with each other, in fact have never met before, that she is a princess and he a birdman. But that only makes it typical of this charming, innocent, and utterly unpredictable opera. Here are Walter Berry and the silvery-voiced Gundula Janowitz. In the next scene we catch up with the prince. He has been led onwards by the three boys who hover over him in a heavenly chariot singing that he must be steadfast, patient, and keep silent. Boys fly off when they have brought the young prince to three Egyptian temples dedicated to reason, nature, and wisdom. The prince approaches the first two, and mysterious voices tell him to go back. Then he approaches the third, the central temple of wisdom, and the temple door opens before him. An old priest comes forth to tell the prince, surprisingly, that Sorastro is not evil, but good. He has taken Pamina from her mother for reasons that cannot yet be revealed. Left alone, the prince wonders, O oh, everlasting night, when will you end? And mysterious voices answer, Balt, soon, soon, young man, or never. He then asks them, Is Pamina still alive? They answer, Pamina Pamina is still alive. It's an answer that Ingmar Bergman made much of in his film, The Hour of the Wolf. And later he said, those measures are to me the center of all of Mozart and also of the whole history of civilization.
Heartened that his Pamina still lives, Tamino raises his magic flute to his lips, and animals of every description appear, dancing to his music. For a moment, Tamino is an Orpheus, charming the beast. Then our flute-playing prince hears the pan-pipes of Papageno in the distance and hurries off to look for him. But echoes are confusing in Zorastro's kingdom, and Papageno and the princess come on stage from the opposite direction, with Monostatos and a troop of Moorish slaves in hot pursuit. Suddenly Papageno remembers his magic bells, plays a nursery tune on them, and the ferocious pursuers start to dance harmless as nursery toys. Finally, to end Act One, the man we've been waiting all along to see approaches, Sarastro himself, in a chariot pulled by lions. Papageno, expecting the worst, is terrified. Pamina, in a famous E-flat phrase, sings that they must tell die Wahrheit, die Wahrheit, the truth. Well, die Wahrheit was also the name of one of the Masonic lodges in Vienna. Sorastro, as the old priest told us would be the case, turns out to be a wise old man, gentle with Pamina, but unable to tell her just now why he had taken her away from her mother. Meanwhile, Monostatos has caught someone, the prince, and he expects a reward for it. But Sorastro only orders Monostatos to be whipped for his cruel treatment of the princess. He also commands that the prince and the princess who now catch sight of one another for the first time, be separated and led by different paths into the temple of wisdom. Papageno is led within too, but he must surrender his magic bells, and Tamino must surrender his magic flute. Are you still with me? Does it make any sense? Does it seem like the center of the whole history of civilization? Or is it just a third-rate fairy tale? Well, it's more or less received wisdom among opera-goers outside of German-speaking lands that while the magic flute contains a lot of charming and often sublime music, it is saddled with the most nonsensical libretto this side of Il Trovatore. I tend to think that the magic flute and Il Trovatore are two of the best librettos ever set to music, some other time, perhaps, I can defend Verdi's masterpiece. Here, it's my pleasure to speak for Mozart's. And I'll say, for starters, that to be convinced of the worth of the libretto of the magic flute, one has only to see the opera in a city where German is spoken, 
where it was an instant success and has continued perhaps the most popular opera in the repertory for two centuries, where its characters' names have become household words, where one of the greatest of all intellects, Goethe, was so taken with it, he began work on a sequel, where both philosophers and those humble people the poet calls the best philosophers, children, still watch it with equal amounts of levity and gravity. It will help our understanding to know how this peculiar entertainment was hatched. Mozart had wanted for some ten years to write another opera in his native German, and one designed not for some imperial court, but for people of all social classes. But he hesitated when the subject of the magic flute was suggested. Vienna's theaters had already had their fill of magic mirrors, magic arrows, and magic rings, and now he was approached by the very impresario responsible for some of those, Emanuel Schikaneder, with another story from a book of oriental tales of magic. Should he compose this magic flute? Mozart had known Schikaneder from some ten years earlier. His father once had him as a house guest in Salzburg. A jolly fellow, good at bowling and archery, an erstwhile strolling player who had learned what we call show business from the bottom up, an entertainer who believed in giving the public what it wanted. He ran a Freihaus Theater, a popular theater in a tax-free housing development outside the old walls of Vienna, the Theater auf der Wieden. Now, we oughtn't to put Schikaneder down as some Viennese counterpart of Broadway Billy Rose. He was one of the first Germans to play Hamlet and Lear. After Mozart died and the low-priced theater was torn down, Schikaneder opened the Theater an der Wien, a famous house that still stands, and he persuaded Beethoven to write for it. We owe him a lot for that, as Beethoven eventually wrote Fidelio. And without Schikaneder, we would never have had the magic flute either. On the other hand, he was canny enough to seclude Mozart in a tiny summer house in the courtyard of his suburban theater and keep him composing there, vain enough to see to it that his own name pretty well crowded Mozart's off the title pages and advertisements, ham enough to annoy Mozart when he assumed the role of Papageno himself and overplayed it, crafty enough to arrange for almost all the money, and there was a lot of it, to find its way into his, not Mozart's, pockets. A fascinating figure, that Schikaneder. The subject that Schikaneder suggested came from the poet Wieland, from a story called Lulu. It was simplicity itself. A good fairy sends the prince Lulu to rescue her daughter from a wicked wizard, she presents the prince with a flute that will allow him to change his shape at will and calm the passion in anyone who opposes him. The prince makes his way disguised into the wizard's castle, plays the flute, puts the evil man to sleep, and escapes with the princess. Finally, the good fairy flies over the castle playing the flute, and the evil castle vanishes. In short, Schikaneder wanted Mozart to write a typical Viennese fairy tale pantomime, a magic opera, a Zauberoper, with plenty of spoken dialogue between the songs, plenty of scope for crowd-pleasing stage machinery, and, Schikaneder hoped, a big fat part for himself. Then, if you believe the handbooks, even some of the best, Mozart started composing and was about halfway through the first act when an opera called The Magic Zither opened in the neighborhood, and Mozart and Schikaneder felt, in desperation, that they had to make their magic opera different. Why the opening of one more magic opera should so upset them is beyond me, but the handbooks go on. They recklessly decided to make their evil wizard, halfway through the first act, a good wizard, and their good queen an evil queen and they did nothing to change what had already been written. That misrepresentation has, incredibly, stuck. People still believe it, I suppose because it explains for them what appear to be inconsistencies in the opera. 
Well, it's wrong. What actually happened? I'd say something like this. Mozart knew that, with some additions, he could make of the Lulu subject the kind of opera he had long wanted to write, an opera with something in it for children and something, too, for intellectuals and something for all the people in between. Both he and Schikaneder were Freemasons. Schikaneder, something of a philanderer, was not always a Mason in good standing and seems actually to have been expelled for loose conduct from the lodge at Regensburg. But Mozart, in his last years, was more and more convinced of the secret society's high ethical aims. He had written some incidental music for a Masonic drama called Famos, King of Egypt. His fellow Freemasons were helping him financially in his time of need. Someone, Mozart or Schikaneder, or perhaps one of Schikaneder's actors, Karl Ludwig Giesecke, who actually claimed years later to be the author of the libretto, some one of them hit on the idea of investing the simple Lulu story with Masonic symbolism. We know the source for most of the editions. It was Zethas, a novel by a French priest, Jean Terrasson, an attempt to link Freemasonry with ancient Egypt. It was only 60 years old, but like Edgar Allan Poe's manuscript found in a bottle, it purported to be a long-lost document, a Greek-Egyptian original from the time of Vespasian. Zethos contains virtually every character or incident in the magic flute that doesn't come from Lulu, the dragon, the three ladies, the queen is vindictive, and all the happenings we'll soon see in Act Two. So the Masonic element in the libretto crafted out of Lulu and Zethos is real. But dealing with it requires considerable delicacy. Many allegorizing commentators have gone too far. If Sarastro represents Freemasonry, then the queen, who first appears as a mater dolorosa and then turns vindictive and evil, must, they say, represent Catholicism. Or, more specifically, Sarastro must be the Masonic scientist Ignaz von Born, an expert on the myths of Greece and Egypt. And the Queen of the Night must be the Empress Maria Theresa, intent on suppressing masonry throughout Austria. Some commentators have gone further. Pamina represents Austria itself, rescued from a benighted mother church by an enlightened Freemasonry. Prince Tamino represents Crown Prince Joseph, who had succeeded his mother and introduced radical reforms. The Moor, Monostatos, represents the black-robed clergy, secretly aiding the church by joining the Masons and working against them from within. Or else Monostatos represents those black-souled initiates in the Viennese lodges who denounce their fellow Masons to the police as dangerous anti-monarchists. Not all of this is satisfactory or even acceptable. Maria Theresa, for one thing, was a far more benevolent and beloved ruler than ever was her son Joseph II, and it was his successor, the new emperor in Mozart's day, Leopold II, who was the real anti-Freemason. Further, Ignaz von Born, the supposed Sarastro, had parted with the Masons several years before the magic flute was written. But some of this commentary is almost certainly right. The magic flute is, on one level, an allegory celebrating the conflict of the Enlightenment, and particularly Masonic Enlightenment, with what was perceived as reactionary Catholic baroquery. The magic flute is a very personal, psychobiographical statement by a still young Catholic composer who turned in his last years to Freemasonry to find strength and inspiration. But to stop at a level of Masonic symbolism is to limit a universal opera severely to its own period. It is to make a mere allegory only partly true out of what is, in the end, a universal and profoundly true mythic statement. The magic flute is more than the struggle between Counter-Reformation 
and enlightenment. It has much more to do with the universals of myth than with the particulars of history. Its meanings, like its music, are prismatic. Like all works of art that deal with myth in intuitive ways, it is ultimately about the human soul. And so it is a parable for any and all of us. And if Ingmar Bergman and many others are right, the magic flute is about more than any one of us. It's about the whole history of civilization. Let's try to see that as we move on to Act Two. Act two begins deep in a grove of silver palm trees with golden leaves. Sorastro and his priests process in to a slow march that sounds to this American from Toronto a lot like O Canada. Maybe Calixa Lavallee, the composer of O Canada, half remembered Mozart when he wrote his anthem. But then Mozart himself seems to have borrowed the tune hastily from one of Schikaneder's earlier magic operas, an Oberon with music by one Paul Ranitsky. But when Mozart borrowed the tune, he improved on it considerably. If you hear his version next to Ranitsky's, you will surely think of the now famous scene in Amadeus where the young Mozart takes a thin little march by Salieri and, on the spot, spins it into an aria for Figaro. It seems something like that actually happened, not with Figaro, but here, at the beginning of Act Two of The Magic Flute. Sorastro nominates young Tamino for admission into his priesthood. Tamino will undergo a series of trials. Papageno will accompany him, and in some of the trials, Pamina will play a part. Sorastro then sings an aria, a deep bass aria, that George Bernard Shaw said was the only music that would not sound blasphemous coming from the mouth of God, though it is hardly something the Judeo-Christian God would be expected to sing. It is an invocation to the Egyptian divinities Isis and Osiris, sung here by Gottlob Frick. Isis was an important figure in Egyptian rituals connected with the dead. In fact, she was believed to have brought her lover Osiris back from the dead. Isis and Osiris are rhyming gods who symbolize rebirth and embody the union of the male and female principles that, we shall now discover, the magic flute is very much about. The scene changes. 
two priests bring our heroes to the depths of the temple and tell them that they will soon see their promised brides with rhyming names. Tamino will see Pamina, and Papageno will see a Papagena like himself. But they must, in this first trial, not speak. Left alone, the companions are unexpectedly visited by the three veiled ladies from Act One. The ladies, in alarm, tell them that Sarastro is lying to them, that the queen has found her way inside the temple to set things right. Then there is a loud clap of thunder, and the ladies flee. Tamino and Papageno have kept silent. They have passed their first test. Next we are in Sarastro's garden by moonlight. Pamina is asleep. The moor Monostatos creeps up on her lustfully and asks the moon to hide its face at what he is about to do. He is sung here by Gerhard Unger. Then the moor is sent scurrying by the sudden appearance of the queen of the night riding the crescent moon. Pamina awakes in fright and hears from her mother some important information that is usually deleted in performances and even recordings of the opera. The queen's sovereignty depends on her taking a series of husbands, each of whom, in accordance with other matriarchal myths we know, she sacrifices when the year is ended. Pamina's father has attempted to end this by sending the symbol of his manhood, the sevenfold circle of the sun, to Sarastro. There is then the imminent possibility that the mother goddess may now have to yield her supremacy to a father god. The queen bursts into one of the opera's famous arias, a star-flaming coloratura piece, fiendishly difficult, with dozens of staccato high C's and four quick F's above high C. In the course of the aria, the queen gives her daughter a dagger and tells her she must kill Sarastro with it. Then she vanishes as suddenly as she came. The moor, who has overheard, threatens to reveal everything to Sarastro unless Pamina yields to him in love. Suddenly Sarastro is there. He knows everything already. He forgives. In diesen heilgen Hallen, he sings, within these sacred halls, we know no vengeance. This famous aria is an oasis of repose in what came to be called Mozart's Masonic style, and its second verse is explicit. In diesen heilgen Mauern, within this sacred masonry, human beings love one another. Sarastro reaches as often below the staff as the queen had reached above it, and his aria is in its quiet way, 
a direct response to hers. <laughs> The juxtaposition of the two famous arias of the ambivalent queen and the wise old man is as much a clue to the meaning of the magic flute as Mozart is going to give us. To anyone who has read Sir James Fraser or Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell on myths, the implication is that Sarastro has taken Pamina from her mother so that she can, with Tamino, reestablish moon and sun, female and male principles, in a new peaceful order. Next we see the prince and the birdman led through a second level of the temple, still pledged to silence. Papageno can't keep still, though, and when a hideous old crone appears, he starts chatting with her. He discovers that the superannuated harridan has designs on a boyfriend ten years older than she, and his name is Papageno. He shuts up pretty quickly when he hears that and is relieved when she disappears. Then Pamina appears to Tamino. He keeps his silence as ordered, and she, uncomprehending, for this is a test for her too, sings her heartbroken aria, Ach, ich fühl's, Ah, I feel it. Sarastro's priests then assemble in front of the pyramids to invoke Isis and Osiris. Sarastro imposes on his young Isis and Osiris the supreme test of will. He tells Pamina and Tamino they must say farewell forever. <laughs> In a third level of the temple, the three boys restore to Tamino his magic flute, and Papageno gets his magic bells again. These will help them in their new tests. Papageno says, and some gentlemen in the audience will agree with him, that he's had enough of these tests, and that what he really needs is a drink. A glass of wine appears miraculously. 
Papageno drinks it and is overcome by a longing for a wife of his own. He rings his magic bells and sings an aria like something you might have learned in kindergarten. Perhaps you did if you went to a kindergarten where they sang Ein Mädchen oder Weibchen. I wish I had a wifey. One night during the initial run of the magic flute, Mozart wasn't too happy about the way Schikaneder, playing Papageno, hammed up the first act for a loud-mouthed friend in the audience. Mozart had his revenge during this second act number. Schikaneder didn't know how to play the glockenspiel, the magic bells. He just went through the motions on stage and had a musician backstage play for him. Well, Mozart slipped backstage, took over the set of bells there, and introduced unexpected arpeggios at all the wrong moments. On stage, Schikaneder tried in vain to keep up with the tinkles and trills, then looked frantically into the wings, saw Mozart, smashed the stage bells to the ground, and shouted, like Sieg Ruman in Ninochka, Will you stop that? Will you get out of here? Well, Papageno's song only brings on the old crone again. He wants a wife? She'll marry him. Because it looks like she's the best he's ever going to get in this impossible place, he finally agrees to marry her. And just for a moment she turns into a beautiful bird girl, the Papagena of his dreams. But in another moment she is gone. Then the music goes serious again. We're in Sorastro's garden, where Pamina has taken up the dagger her mother gave her to kill not Sorastro, as she was told to do, but herself, because the silent Tamino seems not to love her any more. The three boys appear and assure her that he really does love her, but he must prove himself a hero. Is she strong enough to help him? We come to the greatest scene in the opera. We are in a mountainous landscape where two men in armor stand guard on either side of a pyramid with a mysterious inscription. The orchestra begins in the three-flat key of C minor. Then the strings play the Kyrie of a Catholic Mass, popular in Mozart's day. Then the two armed men Karl Liebel and Franz Kross in our recording sing over the Catholic Curie a Lutheran chorale.
But the words they sing are not a Christian hymn. They are a translation of the inscription on the pyramid. He who wanders through these terrifying paths will be purified by fire and water, earth and air. If he overcomes the fear of death, he will mount from earth to sky. He will be filled with light and worthy to consecrate himself to the mysteries of Isis. The mixture of Catholic and Protestant music reminds us of the credo of Bach's B minor Mass, which also combines, ecumenically, two quite distinct liturgical idioms. But the additional overlay here of Masonic words, of the myths of Egypt, and, in a minute, the myths of the Greeks and the Germans, all this is utterly new with the magic flute, part of its wonder, of its endless complexity. In this mountainous landscape where all civilizations come together, Tamino and Pamina meet and, at last, speak. In fact, they speak in matching musical phrases, complementing each other like Isis and Osiris. She will undergo his trial with him. In fact, she says that she will lead him, but he must play on his magic flute. Her father carved it long ago from a primeval oak tree a thousand years old. It will keep them safe. The flute is a talisman, like the golden bough that gives Virgil's hero Aeneas safe passage through the underworld. So Tamino and Pamina begin their perilous journey together. They pass into the pyramid and thence through the first mountain's cavern of swirling fire and then through the second mountain's cavern of rushing water, he playing all the while on her father's magic flute. Mozart wrote a quiet, unearthly march for this with mysterious kettle drum footbeats. It is like putting footprints down in space. emerge from the trial unscathed, successful where Orpheus and Eurydice had failed. The mysterious voices of Act I proclaim that together they have passed the final test. Purification by fire and water is a ritual in many religions. In the Catholic Easter Vigil, the Church passes through the night, purifying itself by lighting new fire and blessing new water. The readings are from Genesis. Let there be light, and the Spirit of God moved over the water. The night is hymned, O truly blessed night, when heaven is wedded to earth. And at the door of the church, before the celebrant enters to say the Easter Mass, the lit candle is plunged three times into the Easter water, fructifying it. Descende in hanc plenitudinem fontis. Fire, the archetypal symbol of the male, impregnates the archetypal female water, and the church is reborn. Well, that's one shiveringly beautiful formulation, and peoples of other beliefs will have their own formulations, of what Mozart, from many different traditions, gives us here. Renewal, rebirth, regeneration, Isis and Osiris. All is well now for the prince and princess. But what of Papageno? He's forlorn under a palm tree. Now it's his turn to think about saying farewell to a cruel world. He appeals to the audience, shades of Mary Martin as Peter Pan, to help him screw up his courage to end it all. He'll hang himself on that very palm tree. 
At the Salzburg Marionette Theater, all the little boys and girls shout, No! No! Suddenly, Mozart's three boys are there. Remember your magic bells. I forgot all about the magic things, he replies, and plays them. And lo, his papagena appears. No longer a vintage virago, but a helpmate as yearningly youthful and fully feathered as himself. In this recording, she's Ruth Margaret Potts. They sing a barnyard duet about all the little papaginos and papaginas they will have, and there's hardly a more joyful piece of music in existence. <laughs> Finally, at the very bottom of Sarastro's temple, the queen of the night, her three ladies, and Monostatos, who has gone over to their side, are overwhelmed by thunder. The stage goes dark. Then, in a burst of light, Sarastro, the three boys, the prince and princess, the bird man and the bird woman, appear, ranged around the sevenfold circle of the sun, proclaiming the victory of light over darkness. And now we might well ask, what does it all mean? I want to approach it not as an allegory of the struggle between the Counter-Reformation and the Enlightenment, but as an allegory of mankind's progression from nature to culture, from unreason to reason, and especially from matriarchy to patriarchy. Man's first deities, so far as we can tell, were not father gods, but mother goddesses. In our oldest mythologies, Mother Earth antedates Father Sky. Gaia is older than Uranus. The first social groups were familial and tribal. Taboos, spells, and magic were important for them. Only when, inevitably, there was contact and conflict with outsiders was there a slow, painful movement towards larger communities. Magic then was succeeded by ritual, Taboo gave way to morality. The family circle recognized the rights of a wider civilization, and the mother goddess yielded to a father. This may be thought to be one of the great evolutionary moments in the prehistory of the race. The memory of it was preserved for us, not by historians, but by myth-makers. Later, it was dramatized for us in one of the great periods of civilization, in classic Athens by Aeschylus in his Oresteia, and by Sophocles in his Antigone. If we scale this down to a fantasy level, we have a surprisingly workable analysis of Mozart's opera, where man and woman move from nature to reason. Remember the names of the two temples Tamino had to move back from? He entered the central temple, Wisdom, first, before he made the journey from natural mother to reasoning father. It is not at all inconceivable that Mozart and Schikaneder should have known and planned this. Classic myths were part of an educated person's fund of knowledge in the 18th century, and Mozart could easily have discussed both Greek and Egyptian lore with Ignaz von Born, the Freemason scientist he had known for many years. 
But perhaps we will choose to think less anthropologically and more mythically, less in terms of society as a whole and more in terms of the individual. The hero myth is a fashionable study again, thanks to the popular TV conversations between Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers and the renewed interest in the writings of Carl Jung. The mythic hero of Campbell and Jung goes on a quest for his father, though at first he may not realize quite what he is looking for. Ultimately, the male's quest for the father is a quest for his own self. If he is fortunate, he is joined in his travels by a companion of his own sex, but of a different age or race or caste or level of sophistication, who represents everything which the hero himself is not. Jung calls this figure the shadow, potentially dangerous to the psyche of the hero unless won over. But if he is won over, the shadow is helpful to the hero, as Tonto is to the Lone Ranger, or Cato to the Green Hornet, or Jim to Huck Finn, or Sancho Panza to Don Quixote, or Pylades to Orestes, or Patroclus to Achilles, or Achates to Aeneas. The hero then must meet his feminine. Initially she is fearsome and often represented in the figure of the dragon. But if the hero, like the knight of old, can defeat the potentially destructive aspect of the feminine, slay the dragon, he will release the feminine's creative potential, free the maiden in distress. Jung calls this feminine archetype the anima, potentially destructive, potentially creative ever ambivalent. The hero then encounters his masculine archetype, which Jung calls the wise old man. He usually appears in bright sunlight and gives the hero a pattern for living his life. Finally, the hero achieves maturity when he integrates all of these experiences, especially what he has learned of his feminine and masculine, around some centripetal circular pattern which Jung calls the self. Well, think of Tamino as your archetypal male hero, befriending his opposite in Papageno, encountering his anima in the Queen of the Night, who obligingly has the dragon slain for him and then expects him to free the maiden in distress, discovering the wise old man in Sarastro, integrating the experiences by passing with his princess through fire the archetypal male symbol, and water, the archetypal female symbol, and finally finding completion in the circular figure of the sevenfold sun. It's all in Jung, and most of it works two centuries before Jung in Mozart. Or you can take all this mythologizing more personally. Think of Pamina as a child maturing. Before birth, a child and its mother are one. Then, after the physical sundering at birth, a process of spiritual separation begins. The child learns to speak, to experience, to find other relationships, most importantly with a new commanding figure, the father. Psychologists distinguish between mother and father principles. The mother, physical source of being, is nature. The father, a new and separate influence, is culture, discipline, and law. The mother's love is protective and lavished unconditionally on the child. The father's is won through obedience to commandments. The child normally progresses from the mother to the father and reaches maturing when he or she achieves a synthesis of maternal intuition and paternal reason in himself or herself. Seen this way, the Queen of the Night is not, however she may appear to some of the characters on stage, a personification of evil. She is a personification of the dark unconscious, where intuition reigns and reason is unknown, of nature, who nurtures and also destroys, of the closed family or tribal circle, which guards its own traditions in the face of change of motherhood, which wants to but cannot, however much the child might wish it, be indulgent and protective forever. 
The ambivalent queen is served by three ambivalent ladies who bestow magical intuitive gifts. Together they represent a never-never land which children are delighted and contented with but must outgrow. On the other hand, Sarastro is not a personification of good. He is that bright consciousness which is the beginning of reason, which builds cities and civilizations, and is associated archetypally with the Father. He too is ambivalent, abducting those he would purify, subjecting them to cruel and horrendous ordeals, yet behind the frightening exterior, benevolent and ultimately just. He is served by an ambivalent villain, symbolically dark-skinned because he is a shadow figure who, like the Satans of literature, Lucifer in Paradise Lost, Caliban in The Tempest, Mephistopheles in Faust, is not so much evil as the unwitting instrument of good. Tamino moves from the mother's natural paradise where flowers grow in rocks and beautiful ladies baby him to the father's civilized kingdom where the emphasis is on striving, virtue, and achievement. Like the heroes in literature, like Homer's Achilles and Virgil's Aeneas, he is at first mother-bound, but comes eventually to see that he must listen to and then become a father. Papageno, too, begins in a blissful state of irresponsibility. He calls himself a child of nature. His peccadilloes are punished in childish, game-like ways. He has no worries except that he cannot find a mate. It is, of course, his prolonged service to the mother goddess that has kept him infantile. With the prince, he attempts the journey from nature to culture. Though only half human, and so not fully equipped to live a life of reason, he is rewarded, as is the prince, with a feminine companion like himself, a counterpart who is a completion and a fulfillment. The father's kingdom, then, does not so much oppose the mother's as complement it. The new realm appropriates the intuitive gifts of the old and restores them. The queen's flute and bells still work their intuitive magic in Sarastro's land of reason. The three boys, too, move easily from one kingdom to the other. In fact, they embody what the myths that make up the opera are all about. They sing with feminine sweetness the ideals of masculine reason. Like the flute and the bells, like all children, the three boys partake of the nature of both kingdoms. So the magic flute is about mankind's evolutionary progress from the mother's realm to the father's. But I don't think that, as it dramatizes this, it turns into some sort of anti-feminist tract. It tells us, in fact, that both realms are important. The continuity of the mother's world in the father's is clearly established in Mozart's music. Let me explain. You often read that each character in the magic flute lives in a separate musical idiom. That's certainly true. The queen's high coloratura is ornamentally baroque. Sarastro's low bass solos are in Mozart's new Masonic style. Papageno sings folk tunes. Tamino is as Edward Dent has observed, Italian and classical, Pamina, German, and almost romantic. It's all very carefully done. So it is all the more significant that across the carefully divided musical lines, almost identical melodies sound. The phrase sung in the Queen's realm when Tamino receives his magic flute is echoed in Sarastro's realm as Sarastro prays. Even the words correspond to a degree. And similarly, the Queen's first revelation to Tamino in her lunar world corresponds to the wondering phrase Tamino sings as he lifts his eyes in Sarastro's world.
These and other similarities of musical phrase indicate that what takes place in the opera is not so much a conflict of opposing forces as a transition from one experience to another. The older feminine is not entirely destroyed. Its best values, flute and bells, three boys, beautiful princess, that is to say, intuition, incipient wisdom, natural beauty, are assimilated into the new world of Sarastro. When John Updike retold the story of the magic flute for children, he expressed the belief that even the queen survived and married Sarastro, and Tamino played his flute at the wedding. But Updike spoke from the wisdom of hindsight. We now know, two centuries later, that what the queen represents was in fact not destroyed, that the irrational re-emerged after the 18th century's attempt to suppress it in 19th century romanticism. Reason alone is never sufficient. Day wanes, the sun sets, civilizations decay, and nature comes running back. Goethe, writing in the Enlightenment but anticipating the inevitable onslaught of Romanticism, wanted to show some of this in a sequel to The Magic Flute. It remained a fragment, partly because no composer cared to risk comparison with Mozart by setting it. But it clearly indicates that the greatest intellectual of the century thought The Magic Flute was much more about the cycles of civilization than about contemporary Freemasonry. In Goethe's sequel, the Queen of the Night reappears to claim not Pamina, but Pamina's infant son, the new century, and Sarastro leaves his masonry to journey across the earth, a nameless wanderer. Goethe is forecasting here his greatest work, part two of Faust, where the civilizing masculine is saved by the eternal feminine. He was also pointing to the great musical mythic work of the upcoming century, Wagner's Ring, and the eventual triumph there of the intuitive, the irrational, and the feminine over Father Wotan the Sky God, his city-building schemes, and his misguided hopes for world power. In Wagner's 19th century ring, everything we see in the 18th century flute comes full circle, the father's masonry falls, the hero and heroine die, the mother returns to her eternal dreams, the three maidens regain their intuitive heritage. The enlightenment is over. Those who strove for conscious power are destroyed. Only nature and the feminine unconscious are left to guide the world. Is Mozart's opera then incomplete, lacking in vision, naive in its optimism? No, not at all, for the movement towards reason and civilization and father archetype will always begin again. Creation balances destruction, classic answers romantic. Perhaps that is why opera lovers like to hear a little Mozart between their long sessions with Wagner. The balance is important. With Wagner we are plunged into a subconscious world that affirms the reality and exalts the power of unreason. With Mozart, we regard the progress toward reason and order with an emotion that is conscious and clearly objectified, and we do not miss the thunder of Wagner. Perhaps now we can see something of why Mozart, so popular with the public, was slighted in his day by the wealthy, the powerful, and the privileged. His music was more than they could appreciate when, as was their habit, they half-listened. It was well ahead of its time, as only the most perceptive spirits of the day realized. And his operas, which he rightly thought his greatest works, not only blended serious and comic traditions in surprising new ways, they sounded depths of meaning never dreamed of in opera before. Mozart said about the magic flute that, while the delight and applause that came from people of all levels of sophistication gratified him, what pleased him most was the silent applause, when people, touched by the music, quietly wondered what it all meant. Why was Mozart deserted at his death? The cold facts of the case, now thoroughly detailed in new books by H. C. Robbins Landon and Folkmar Braunbehrens, 
are that for a few years, Joseph II issued strict regulations for burials for reasons of public health and to relieve poor families of heavy funeral expenses. Last farewells were to be made at the church and deceased bodies were then quickly buried in sanitary ways. Unmarked common graves were for a time the rule. Mozart's burial was then not dishonorable or notably different from that of any other bourgeois in 1791. But of course, Mozart wasn't just any other bourgeois. His death still seems the classic rejection of genius by a world not yet ready to receive it. Today in Vienna, they've pulled down the Mozart court completely at Rauensteingasse 8 and replaced it with a delivery entrance for a department store. But Mozart himself is more popular in Vienna and throughout the world than ever before. We are more than ever ready to receive the magic flute as supremely civilized music because it blends Italian and German, classic and romantic, comic and tragic, reason and unreason, nature and culture, masculine and feminine, Osiris and Isis, Apollo and Dionysus, sophisticated and unsophisticated, as no other music does. There is a wonderful completeness about it and a marvelous lightness. Almost any other composer confronted with the issues in this opera would have weighted it with significant capital S music. With Mozart, even the most sublime moments are luminous and light, especially those moments when the three intuitive angels sing the sweet uses of reason. The three boys sailing in their heavenly chariot, leading us onwards. It was Karl Barth, I believe, who said that when the angels play for God, they play Bach. But when they play for themselves, they play Mozart. And God listens secretly. <laughs> 